Python Show. Hello and welcome to the Python Show. This is your host, Mike Driscoll. And today we have a special guest, uh, Stephen Krupetta, uh, coming to us from the UK. Um, Stephen is a friend of mine from Twitter, and he does a lot of really cool stuff on Twitter. He's got the Python coding book where he talks a lot about using uh, Python and the Turtle library. Um, he's also recently started the code, Python coding uh, Slack newsletter, which is really awesome. You should definitely check it out. And I also know him from Real Python, where he occasionally writes. So welcome uh, to the show, Stephen. Hey, thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Um, we do spend a lot of time on Twitter, as so I think it, it seems like we've uh, it seems like we know each other so well from Twitter. So yeah, I know. I said this. We were just talking about this and how it's like virtual friends, but we're actually friends. That's really cool. Indeed, indeed. Thank, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's good to have you as well. So let's start out by having you just tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey to like programming in general. Yeah, I think. Uh, you often hear about programming journeys, and one thing you realize is that they're all different. I mean, some people started mm -hmm. coding when they're two years old and never stopped. I'm, I'm not one of those. Um, I didn't really do any coding when I was, you know, maybe I dabbled a bit when I was a teenager, but not really. Mm -hmm. um, in my undergrad, uh, I didn't do computer science. I studied maths and physics, and I had one, one, one module at some point. Uh, it was Pascal, actually. That's, that's the language we learned. But oh, it was cool. one of those modules, you know, you just, you need to get the credits, you know, you get it done. I, I can't say I left my undergrad knowing any programming. It was then when I moved on, uh, that's when I came to the UK and I started doing my research work. Uh, I was doing a PhD here in London. And uh, on day one, you realize I need to be able to program. So I was doing a PhD in physics and the type of research I was doing, the research group I was in, uh, Programming was a key part in all the stages mm -hmm. and sort of modeling what you're doing, analyzing data. So on day one, I'm like, ah, I need to learn how to program. And yep. you know, you sort of, you, you, that's how it started. Um, initially, it was a tool for me to do my research. Um, over the years, I started to enjoy it more, get better at it. It's sort of like a, a virtual circuit, right? You, you get better at it, you enjoy it more, so you get even better at it. Mm -hmm, and yeah. um, this was MATLAB. So most of my research years was using uh, MATLAB, which was uh, quite common at the time, still is, but yeah. was especially common at the time in sort of the science academic environment. So, so that's how I came into programming almost uh, as an accident, if you like, as, as a tool I needed for my scientific work. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I know a lot of people who use MATLAB. Uh, my my old employer used it quite a bit when they were uh, modeling like GPS coordinates and mapping systems and stuff. So, you know, I know it's popular and I know a lot of people are kind of transitioning to like using um, Python and I think it's MATLAB a lot. I know they're not exactly the same. They're not like a drop and replacement, but... But they're very similar, yes. I mean... Yeah. Um... I started my research in 2000, so Python was obviously it existed, but it was much different to, to what it is now. So I think at the time, um, MATLAB was very common in all of these uh, mm -hmm. sci scientific environments. Um, nowadays, I think uh, there's been a bit more of a shift away from MATLAB, which is quite expensive, to yes. Python, which is obviously not. Uh, uh, and also Python has this broad community that in some ways, it can do almost anything that MATLAB can do, but it can do lots more, and you have mm -hmm. this community to go around. So uh, if I were redoing my research work now, I'm sure I'd be doing Python, not MATLAB. But um, yeah, uh, all those years ago, uh, that was that was the choice. Yeah, I totally, under I totally get that. Um, they, they weren't teaching Python when I was in university either. So it was, it was kind of funny to hear you talk about Pascal, because they were teaching COBOL when I was, when I was in college. <laughs> Right. Cobol and C++. Yeah, no. Um, uh, um, I think Python just about had started when I did my undergrad, so it, it could never have been Python. So, Yeah, I think Python started, I want to say 1991-ish was when the yeah, first yeah. No, one I, got released. Yeah, I was released. a bit later, to be fair, but yeah, it, it was certainly not, not a popular language. I mean, I was doing my no. undergrad in 96 to 2000, I think. So, yeah, um, yeah. things have changed. So this kind of transitions into my next question for you, but why are you focused on Python now versus some other language? Um, well, that's a good question. So when I, I talked how 
I worked in scientific research for a while, so this was my first career, if you like. And then mm -hmm. um, seven, eight years ago, I sort of decided for all the, whatever reasons to move on from academia. And, um, and one thing I liked a lot about my previous work in research, apart from the science, obviously, I, mm -hmm. by the end of it, I enjoyed programming. And I also enjoyed the teaching side. Um, as an academic, I taught undergrads. And unlike many other academics, I actually enjoyed the teaching. So then when I moved on from academia, I thought, okay, one thing I can do is I like programming, I like teaching, let me merge them. And that's how I got into the teaching of programming. But clearly, mm. MATLAB wasn't going to be the language I'm going to do that in. So yeah. Python came about because, uh, two reasons, I guess. First of all, coming from a scientific background, by the time I finished my academic career, Python was becoming the other language. You had MATLAB and you had Python were sort of, so it was an obvious science-based language. So I could sort of carry on what I was bringing in from the scientific programming from mm -hmm. MATLAB into Python. And also it was, uh, you know, a, a very language growing so quickly. It sort of made sense to go down the Python route. The other reason is that a lot of what I do is, especially when I first moved on from academia, is to actually teach kids. Um, mm. I mean, on Twitter, I, 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 we'll probably talk about turtle. That's where the turtle comes in. But on Twitter, I talk about all sorts of things. But on my day job, as it were, um, uh, you know, we focus a lot on teaching kids on a daily basis, and we do it using Python. And again, the decision there is sort of uh, almost straightforward, right? If you, if you want to teach kids a proper language, Python seems to tick all the boxes. So I think for all those reasons, the yeah. sort of the, the scientific background I had and it was an ideal language to teach beginners, especially uh, children. It made sense for me to transition from MATLAB to Python. And that's where I started to yeah. learn more about Python and, uh, and, and start to teach it eventually. So I'm curious, because I've, I've, I'd like to start teaching my daughter Python. How, how young is your age group go when we, you're teaching so Python? We start from seven years old, which is oh, wow. fairly young. Um, obviously, what you do with seven, eight-year-olds is very different to what you do with 14, 15 year olds. Mm -hmm. um, but it's surprising how they can pick up. Uh, this is where the turtle module will come in, right? We use the turtle module a lot because yeah. you can start from day one creating things that are visual and exciting. And you don't need a lot of code to get something that looks pretty on the screen with the turtle module. So seven year olds can start to do. There isn't a lot of typing you need to do. I mean, one of the biggest problems yeah. seven-year-olds have is actually the the typing and the spelling. But if yeah. you have autocomplete and you know you have short lines, you know, Fred dot forward, there isn't that much typing to do. So, um, mm -hmm. um, so, so they can start, and then as they grow, they can obviously start to do more complex things. So, yeah, seven-year-old is where we start, which is younger hmm. than most to teach Python, but um, it, it does work. Well, that's good to know. I know a lot of people start with Scratch when they're that young. And then move to Python. Yeah, I want to say in their teenage years. It 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 varies a lot. I think. I mean, uh, I, I don't deal much with schools, but I think one of the biggest problems with schools overall is that it's much harder to teach Python than to teach Scratch. Um, so I hmm. think some schools tend to keep on teaching Scratch just because it's a bit more manageable uh, without okay. having the programming expertise. Um, it becomes yeah. harder to teach Python. There are exceptions, of course. There are, you know, I mean, I'm sure you and I know some brilliant teachers on Twitter, but not every school in every country has uh, those, you know, expert programmers who... So, so I think I think that's the reason why yeah. Scratch tends to persist a bit longer because it's easier to teach as well. Yeah, and I think some countries just uh, emphasize it more. Because I, I recently learned, I think it was last year, that like the fr France is like mandated Python in schools, I believe. It's like the official language they're teaching. Okay. Um, I know that coding in schools uh, all around the world, I think in the last sort of five to 10 years, it's sort of become part of the curriculum in pretty much every country now. But mm -hmm. I think um, different countries take different approaches, I know. And uh, um, I, I'm, I'm sure that in the later years, uh, Python is is the obvious choice, as we were saying earlier. It, it seems like yeah. it's obvious choice to teach children for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, I agree. I'm I'm waiting for America to actually do that a little bit more. I think it seems to be a popular elective in high school, which is, you know, like 15 to 18 year olds. But I don't think it's not like it's a requirement. And so a lot of people don't even get to dabble in it until they're yeah. almost out of their school years, which is unfortunate. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think I think the challenge with teaching uh, programming using a, a full feature programming language, um, you, you know how it is. Uh, you, you can have hundred ways that a program can go wrong, and I think an experienced programmer can spot that quickly and help their student. But if you're yes. not an experienced programmer, you might spend a lot of time, and that and that restricts what you can teach. I think so. I think yeah, it's not an, it's not an easy subject to teach unless you have that uh, good level of expertise. Um, yeah. You need to be more than a step or two above the children, I think. So th- that's what makes it a bit harder, I think. But. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. All right. Well, I don't really, I don't really want to change the subject, but we need to keep moving along. So, yeah. you, uh, <laughs> tell us uh, more about your Python coding book because I think that's really cool, and I'd, I'd like our listeners to know more about it too. Yeah, I think um, um, I've always liked writing. Uh, during my research mm-hmm. years, you know, I, I liked coding and teaching, but I also liked writing. I think. Uh, I was unusual in that, you know, when I was doing my PhD thesis, I actually enjoyed the process of writing, the actual writing yeah. thesis. Um, so when I when I was teaching uh, Python to adults, uh, I always felt like I want to give them some notes that reflect the way I teach. Uh, there are great books out there, uh, such as yours, uh, Mike. Um, but when you're mm. teaching, you sort of want to give your students something that is in the same tone, in the same style as how you're teaching them. Yeah. So I started sort of writing some notes, and then those notes grew and they grew a bit more, and eventually um, they became a book. And I think the main thing about it is that it is my vision of how programming is. It's very much mm-hmm. my personal way of, of seeing programming. And therefore, for those students who might teach, and now hopefully for anyone else who wants to read it, it's, in, as it were, it's like my perspective of how I see programming. I like to think of it as yeah. it's the book I would have liked to have when I was learning. It's the way I learn, the way I see things. So hopefully some other people might also see things the way I do and and resonate with how how I write. Um, so yeah, you know, primarily I write because I enjoy writing. But hopefully uh, it, it has some benefit <laughs> for some people who like what I write as well. So um, it's not quite finished, I have to say. It's uh, it's in late beta stage. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I still need to tidy it up a bit, and uh, it's still online as well only. So I think that. My next project is to sort of tidy it up and then bring it into other formats. I, I know you're an expert in, in that, uh, Mike, to sort of bring it into some <laughs> other, you know, um, ebook format, PDF format, who knows, maybe printed format. But uh, yeah. at the moment, it's there on the web. It's not great to read because, you know, you have to scroll through pages. So I want to move it into a, a better format. But yeah, I totally get it. Yeah. You... <laughs> You have a, you, your description of the writing process reminds me a lot of my own thoughts on when I wrote my first book. I'm like, man, when I was learning Python, I wanted to know, you know, X, Y, and Z, and none of the books I had at the time taught it. So when I learned how to do it, yeah, I put it on my blog, and then I turned <laughs> those articles into chapters for my first book. So it's it's funny that you're... Your book journey is very similar in, in that respect. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I, wonder, I wonder whether all authors or maybe most authors actually follow the same path as in you, you write the things you want to read and then, yeah. you know, th- that becomes, you know, your style is the way you like to learn. Um, it would be interesting to know whether other authors have the same uh, path. Yeah. I, I will mention I did put my original version of Python 101 online just to um, make it easier to search. And I used I used Sphinx, and it has a nice built-in search utility that just makes searching the entire book really fast. And I really liked that. And I, I keep thinking I'm going to update it to my latest version of Python 101. I just haven't done it yet. But I don't I don't know. I haven't looked at your book in a while. If you, if you if you don't have that search capability, I think it's really helpful to add it because yeah, it makes no, finding think... stuff cool a lot easier. Uh, absolutely, and I mean. In some ways, the the website was there as a work in progress. In fact, um, I was mm-hmm. writing chapters as I went along. So, you know, uh, a year and a half ago, anyone could, going on the website would find the first two chapters and then the third yeah. one and then the fourth. So for me, the website was a way of, look, this is a work in progress. Mm-hmm. Now it's almost complete. Now is when I want to sort of tidy it up and, and sort of yeah. bring it to the, you know, to to the first official release of the book, if you like, rather than the, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the beta yeah. version. <laughs> Yeah, I totally get it. That's, I'm excited to see the the finished product. Yeah, uh, hope hopefully soon. <laughs> Let's see. 
So it looks like you have a newsletter with a very similar name, the Python Coding Slack newsletter. Let's let's talk about that. How did that come about and yeah. what are you excited so, about it? So you can see I've picked the naming style, right? I've got the Python Coding Book and mm -hmm. then I've got the Python Coding Stack. Um, uh, and the website I'm creating for sort of the hub of all of this is the Python Coding Place. So you, you can see mm -hmm. where I'm getting there. Um, there's yeah, a theme so, there. Yeah, there's a theme there, yeah. The, 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 Good or bad, that's my branding now, the Python code and <laughs> something. Uh, um, I think it comes from the, you know, the love of writing. I mean, uh, the book was, the notes for my students, which then became the Python coding book, was mm -hmm. the first writing I did in the, in, the, in, the, in the Python sphere. I had done writing before in my scientific um, um, work. Yeah. Um, and then um, when the Python coding book, you know, most of the chapters were, were in place, I thought, you know what, I'm going to start writing a few blog posts. And, and therefore, I could write sort of articles from time to time. Mm -hmm. And this was a time when, I've, uh, you mentioned earlier, I've published some real Python articles as well. So I started to get more into, rather than just the book, writing standalone articles on a certain topic. And I did this on, on the Python coding book blog for a while. And recently, for a number of reasons, I thought, actually, I'm going to look at another platform. So that's where Substack came in. I thought, yeah, Substack seems to be a place where I can yeah. uh, put all my writing there. There's a nice community there as well, uh, different from Twitter, but, but it has its own vibe. And it also forces me to write more regularly because now it's, it's in a newsletter form. So I mm. feel like before with the blog, I wrote whenever I, you know, whenever I had time and oh, let me write an article. Whereas now it feels like I've put pressure on myself, which is good. I like that. And I'm trying yeah. to sort of write more regularly because it's now a newsletter that's going out to people regularly. So, yes. um, so again, I primarily write because I enjoy it. And often I'm using the writing, you know, I might be, I might pick on a certain topic and a certain, you know, function in, in NumPy say, and often mm -hmm. I'm writing because I want to actually learn about it more myself. You know, I yeah. might have used the function at a superficial level or, you know, maybe used a few of its parameters, but I've never really dived into it. So I'm like, let me write an article about this. It forces me to go into the docs, explore every possible parameter. And then the writing an article is a way of processing those thoughts for me to understand. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, of course, I'm writing about things I know much better and, uh, and, so yeah, it's been um, uh, it's been two months now since I've been uh, uh, publishing. Uh, I'm aiming at one every five days. I'm not sure I can keep that up. Maybe I'll have to go yeah. to one a week. But um, <laughs> um, I find writing as a way of sort of uh, uh, it's relaxing, you know. So if I've had a, a hard day, you know, a busy day doing stuff, I'm like, you know what, I'm going to do a bit now. I'm going to spend a couple of hours writing. It's yeah. uh, it's, it's a bit like sort of you know. Um, meditating or going for a walk i still do that yeah, i still go for a walk um but yeah. writing is is a way of sort of almost uh, unwinding and uh, i i quite enjoy it so oh, i totally get it that's i mean i i write because i like to do it as well and i feel like i haven't been getting a lot of writing done i've been working on trying to do this recording videos or rec or you know even doing this podcast i'm like let's learn something new too and see how i like that as well but I've noticed, you know, sometimes it, it helps to have a mix of formats on the blog as well as just just writing. So that's I don't know, true, yes. kind of experiment. That is, true. that is true. Yeah, I mean, uh, so the writing was my latest push as in to try and do it more regularly, which is why I started the Substack a couple of months ago. And uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I, I'd like to sort of uh, venture into other other forms as well at some point. So uh, videos and. Um, I've got yeah. some video courses I'm thinking of doing. I know you, I know you're also recording lots of video courses. So, uh, as you say, it's nice to mix mix styles. Um, yeah. Not everyone not everyone likes to read. Not everyone likes to watch videos. It's nice to have a bit of both, so that those who mm -hmm. prefer to read can read your material, but those who prefer to watch videos can do that. And some people like to mix and match. I think as well. You know, watch a bit of videos, read a bit. So, I, I'm I'm fully on board there. I think it's nice to have different forms. Yeah. Of I think a lot of people don't understand that from a content creator's point of view, you have to start with the writing, whether it's a video or not. You have to write out the yes. story as a blog post. Maybe it doesn't get published, but you have that, and then you can turn it into a video or a series of tweets or you know whatever. So there's always all this writing in the background, just hidden away that you the you know your readers Absolutely. or your viewers may never see. <laughs> 
absolutely. That's that's how you can flesh out your ideas, right? It's when you've written it in full, and then, as you say, you can sort of um, uh, yeah. repurpose it in other formats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there, there was a time when, um, as 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 you are, and as you know, I'm quite active on Twitter as well, and I think I started uh, early last year. And mm -hmm. uh, there was a time when sort of Twitter was my main. I, I created content for Twitter, but as you mentioned, you know, it's, it's sometimes if you like, actually, first I need to flesh it out fully, and then I figure out how mm -hmm. to you know co co um, change this into you know five, six, seven tweets. Um, yeah. uh, whereas now I've swapped it over. Now my my posts on on the Substack they are my main content, and then once I've published those, I'll take bits and put them on Twitter. So. Yeah, I much prefer it that way as well. Yeah, I think my content cycle has been where blog post, then book, and then take the book and make blog posts out of the book, <laughs> <laughs> and then make the, those posts into Twitter pieces, and then you can just kind of recycle it into yeah, different yeah, formats. Yeah. It's really and kind of fun. Videos in as well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, take some videos in there. Um, oh, you know, one of the first things that, that attracted me to your Twitter account was all these these cool animations you do with, with the turtle module. So, you know, you've talked a little bit about that, but, you know, why do you use the turtle module so much in your examples? Yeah. And what do you it, like about it? It feels like I'm building a bit of a reputation as the turtle man. Is it? Funny enough, I, I don't <laughs> post that much. I mean, most of my content on Twitter, on what I write, I mean, only a small percentage of them are turtle. Um, but I know. I, I, no, no, no. But, you know, look, it's, it's a good thing, <laughs> right? I think I think when people see them, they're like, oh, I didn't know you could do that with the turtle module. You know, often mm -hmm. the turtle modules seem like, Let's draw a few nice shapes and pentagons, and uh, so yeah. I've, I've taken it upon myself to push turrets into the limit. Um, it came from teaching kids, right? Um, when I when I moved to sort of teaching Python um, full time, teaching kids was a big part of it, and I wanted to create my own curriculum, same as with the writing, a curriculum mm -hmm. that reflected um, my approach to teaching coding to kids. Is I want to treat it as a proper subject, you know, the way you would teach maths and science, but it still has to be fun and engaging. And I think that's yeah. where the turret module comes in. Uh, right from day one, you can do something, you know, kids who have never coded in Python, on day one, you can do something that looks pretty. And the kids mm -hmm. will be like, wow, I like that. And then once you've built that tool, you can push the turret module. Uh, of course, you can't only the turret, right? You need to teach them other things. But it's surprising how you can almost every topic in, in sort of beginner, intermediate, even some advanced topics in Python, you can actually teach them via the Turretin module, whether it's hmm. object oriented programming and classes, whether it's more advanced functions, you know, with, uh, mm -hmm. there is a way of fitting them in the data structures, you know, you, you can write complex animations and programs that need, you know, um, all sorts of, you know, you need to think about, do I need a dictionary here? Do I need a list or tuples? Yeah. Um, so you can actually introduce a lot of the fundamentals through um, something which is fun and engaging. So over the years, I've always pushed myself, how can I push the turret module further and further? And uh, mm -hmm. um, again, sometimes when, I'm, when I've had a busy day, I'm like, let me think of something to do in Turtle. And it's another way of relaxing, you know, let me create some animation <laughs> in Turtle. And then I post it on yeah. Twitter. And if people like it, I'm like, I'll write a blog post on this. Yeah, have you ever considered doing like any of those gaming modules that are popular with Python, like Pygame or Piglet or any of those for teaching? So, or? Uh, interesting. So, so yes and no. Um, the reason I like, from a teaching point of view, the reason I like using Turtle mm -hmm. more than Pygame and the other modules is because uh, they're more uh, what I like to call its first principles. So you can they don't do too much for you. So when you're yes. teaching kids uh, or any any age, right? But in this case, when you're teaching kids, you almost don't want a module that uh, hides away lots of functionality. You want mm -hmm. to realize, you know, how do I make two things? Uh, how do I know when two things have hit each other? In the third module, you have to sort of do it manually and figure out when the distance is in another mm -hmm. module. Yeah. So, so I think that's what's nice about the third module is that it forces the students to learn the fundamentals of you know, you need to tell the computer program everything you wanted to do. So that's yeah. why we stick with the turtle module. Um, if the aim was to write games, the turtle module is not the ideal module. But if the oh, aim yeah. is to teach to teach beginners, I think there's a lot of benefit in in sort of 
sticking to turtle because then mm -hmm. you have to do the hard work yourself and that's where the learning comes in rather than abstracting it away in the pi game api say or or whatever it might be so that's the main reason of I've always stuck to turtle purely from a uh, from a teaching point of view. Yeah, well, that makes sense. I totally get that. I, I find some of these frameworks uh, abstract too much away, and then when you have a weird bug, it can be a real pain trying to figure out what it is. Yeah, and sometimes from a learning point of view, you almost don't want too many of these, you know, um, higher level modules because you want to learn how to do things yourself. It doesn't yes. mean that in real life you are, you know, you don't want to reinvent the wheel, but when you're with the learning hat on, you almost mm -hmm. want to so you want to reinvent the wheel sometimes because you want to learn yeah. how it's done, even if then in real life you're going to go and rely on uh, some function, some package. Well, yeah, it's just, it's just it's like a lot of things in, in mathematics where you learn th learn how to do something the hard way, like standard deviation, and then you find how to do it the easy way. Yeah. And you're like, why didn't I learn the easy way first? Like, <laughs> you don't understand it that well if you don't if you don't go there. Yeah. Absolutely, no. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I mean, maths was one of one of my undergrad subjects, and you know, lots of things you do there. Uh, now you can sort of just write a single line in Python, hit enter, and you know, yep. it's, it's done it for you. And I'm like, oh yes, I did this all by hand in my undergrad. But there's a reason for it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it helps yeah. you understand what's happening when you run that function. You know, that says f52. You know, you, you know what the Fourier transform is doing, or whatever it might be, right? Because you've mm -hmm. learned it in the past. So I think I think it's important to know what's happening even if you then rely on the ready-made stuff, so to speak. Yes, I agree. So I always find it interesting to find out um, what common problems you see with your students, just kind of compare it to, you know, the people who read my books and see what they are. They're similar, you know, your kids have the same kind of problems that most of my readers are like adults typically. So I'm just curious, you know, what, what are the common problems you see <clears throat> with your people um, that you teach? I think it's... Uh, I mean, I'm in some ways maybe a bit unusual because I, I teach both kids and adults, so I, I see okay. a lot of both. Um, others do as well, but it's it's quite different. There are similarities, of course, but it's quite different. And mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons is that an adult who's a beginner in programming, you almost need to unlearn how to think. You, you need to stop thinking like a human being and start to think in a computer <laughs> way. And with, yeah. with adults at the very beginning, I think that mindset is the hardest thing. You know, it, it feels like either certain things are too obvious for us humans, but you actually need to write the code to do it. And therefore, they don't see that distinction. Mm -hmm. Kids sometimes are a bit better at that. And uh, I often like to think that it's because they haven't gone through, you know, they haven't spent 20, 30 years learning how to be human. And now they have to mm -hmm. unlearn it. At seven or 10, they still haven't fully learned how to be human. So it's easier for them mm -hmm. to think like a computer. Um, yeah. So the problems are a bit different. I think with, with adults, uh, at the very beginning, it's that mindset. It's learning to think like a computer rather than like a human. Mm. I, I think that's where I find lots of adults stumble. Huh. At the next stage, uh, when they're ready to go from late beginner to intermediate, I think it's a bit of a different problem. I think in the beginning, you know, you learn the for loop, you learn a while loop, you learn how to define functions. You've sort of learned all of these little blocks then you need to almost zoom out and look at look at programming from a bird's eye view. And I think mm -hmm. at, at a later stage, that is a stumbling block sometimes when someone is really good at writing for loops and writing uh, functions or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's zooming out and seeing it as a whole and then bringing it all together. And I think that's a stumbling right. block in getting to the intermediate stage. And, and there's no easy way of teaching that, I think. I think it's, uh, it's another yeah. change of mindset. You know, you need to sort of almost look at programming in a more... A holistic way, if you like. Mm -hmm, yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, I know. I know from my my personal experience when I first learned how to program, I felt like I had a mental block for like the first couple semesters. Really, I'm like, I get the syntax, but I don't really understand how to do anything outside of that. <laughs> it took me a long time. I think it was my third year, and I'm like, oh, it's all coming together now. It's all magical. It's it's amazing. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you're right. And I, I, I think many of us have gone through the truth. And this brings us back to writing. In some ways, uh, my writing is a way of initially for me to process these ideas. You know, I know the syntax, but what does it really mean? You know, and, and the, I started yeah. writing in some ways. It's because I wanted to process these ideas. And, and that's what I'm trying to do with, you know, with the blogs, the, the articles I write and the, and the book. It's almost giving this big picture of trying to 
link things together. You know, I like to use analogies a lot, for example. You know, I think it helps mm-hmm. you on it's understanding what what's happening beyond the what syntax do you use and uh, you know do you put a, a square bracket or a round bracket here as, as, as an, you almost need to look at it uh, yeah. from a distance to, to understand it yeah I totally get that so you know while you were talking about this I, re- I realized I already have this question on my list but I was going to ask you so how do you see uh, AI helping or hurting students in their learning journey because I was I'm like, I don't know what I would have done if I had all these technologies when I was in school. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, like like pretty much everyone else in the last few months, I've been uh, learning how to use uh, all of this generative AI. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, by, I'm, I'm not an expert and I'm not going to pretend to be one. You know, all I, all I know is how yeah. I've been using it. But of course, from an educational point of view, I've been, in fact, one of the recent courses I've run, uh, which finished a couple of weeks ago, it was the first time where I had a section where it's like, look, Let's actually go to GPT and let's let's use mm-hmm. this part of our course, you know. And uh, I think we're all learning that it's a tool like all others. And I think uh, it can harm if a student uses it to uh, to find shortcuts. Because when you're learning, yeah. you, you know, you don't want the shortcuts. And this is especially true, I think, for kids because adults are more, you know, an adult who's learning to code is more mature. They know that, you know, there's no point in cheating in this exercise. Mm-hmm. But with the younger ones, I think, you know, it, it can be detrimental because they'll be like, oh, okay, I'm going to get GPT to write this code, which defeats the purpose of learning. But I think, yes. uh, I think the benefits are so great. I mean, uh, I've been trying to experiment with, uh, I, I use it now instead of Googling something, you know, if I need something. And I'm, I'm, mm. I'm getting my students to think, look, if you have a question, you know, six months ago, I'd say, go on Google as the question, and then you'll end up on Stack Overflow and the documentation, you know. Yeah. Now, before you do that, go to GPT and ask the question, see what it comes up with, and then, yes, go to documentation afterwards as well. So I think it's uh, um, the other place where it's great for learners, I think, especially in the early days when you write some code and then you want some feedback. And, of course, if you have a live person help you, that's great. But yeah. taking that code, putting it to GPT and saying, Dear GPT, you know, I'm a beginner in Python, so you know, take it easy. Can you give me feedback on this code? <laughs> T- taking in, uh, keeping in mind that I'm a beginner, because you don't want, you know, you don't want a beginner to be told, use a Lambda function here. You know, it's like you, you want GPT yeah. to know. It. And I think that's, uh, that's something I want to explore more with my students, um, getting GPT to give you feedback, but at your own level, right? And then as you become more hmm. expert, you say, good, you know, here's my level, you know, you can... Perhaps we need to find a way of prompting GPTB to sort of give it an indication of your level so that the feedback mm-hmm. you get on your code is appropriate to where you are in your journey. Um, so that's something I want to experiment with more and then hopefully hmm. help, help others. Um, it, in the past, you can only do that from a real person, right? I mean, if someone is yeah. learning, the only way you can do that is you have your teacher, your instructor, your tutor or mentor and say, here's my code. Can you give me feedback? That's still important, but I think they now mm-hmm. get more of that feedback uh, or more of a similar type of feedback from GPT. And that, I think, hmm. is a, a good way that learners could use GPT to their advantage. I'm going to have to try that out because I haven't, I haven't used it that way yet. I'm curious to see what it would say about yeah. some code examples. I think I think you need to prompt it for the level because uh, if you just give it, especially if you think of code that a beginner would write, right, which will not yeah. be the same as a, uh, if you plug it to GPT, it's going to tell you, well, okay, change those to comprehension. You know, it will simply give you the more, and <laughs> yeah. as a beginner, like, uh, I've never I've never seen any of this. So I think you need to sort of prompt it, look, I'm a beginner, uh, be kind, you know, sort of thing. Mm. And then it gives you the right feedback for that level. But um, hmm. um, I'm, I'm still experimenting with this as well, so. Yeah, that sounds like fun. I, I definitely need to try that out. I've. <laughs> I've been using it to teach me a little bit of pandas because I don't know pandas very well yet. And yeah. It's fun to see what it'll come up with, but you know, it doesn't always give you uh, executable code. It sometimes gives you garbage. And absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's the main, it might, I mean, I'm sure it will change in the future, but you know, at the moment, whenever I'm introducing it to students, uh, the first thing is, you know, um, be aware it's, it's, it's not a hundred percent accurate source of knowledge. Yeah. So, uh, one thing I've been discouraging students from doing, and I don't do it, is is to get its right code for you. I mean, unless yeah. it's a short function, you know, unless it's a very self-contained function, which is anything beyond that, it's not great. 
Um, but I think yeah. asking it for feedback or asking it, um, I'd like to do this. What function do I need? Um, you know, as a beginner, you might, you know, you might not know about the split function, say the string split. You know, you mm. might go and explain, I would like to do this. And in a way that it's probably going to do better there than Google does, because in Google, you're going to get lots of stack over for pages. And from a beginner's point yeah. of view, yeah. you don't know what's right or wrong. Whereas with those easy questions, um, GPT will get it right most of the time. You know, oh, okay. use the string dot split function. And you're like, good, I know the function yeah. I need or the method I need. Rather. That's cool. I like that idea. Hmm. Uh, we're all, we're all going to be learning a lot. I think it's a, it's, it's a steep learning curve for all of us because it's, it's a new tool. Like every new yes. tool, I think we all need to. And, and it's changing as well. So we're learning. It is changing while we're learning. So I think it's going to be uh, an interesting yeah. few months and years ahead. Yeah, it's only been out like a year or two now. For, so <laughs> I'm still getting used to it. I'm like, what is this thing? So I've been playing with it a little bit. <laughs> well, anyway, that was that was a really good talk. I really enjoyed, uh, you know, learning all the all the cool things that you do, and uh, you know, I, I always enjoy listening to how other people teach. That's that's always fun. So thank you for that. Thank you for having me. No, I, I enjoyed this chat a lot as well. Yeah. So I think we'll just wrap up here, and thank you so much for coming, Stephen. And I hope we can have you on the show again sometime in the future. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yep. See you later. The Python Show.